Well, good morning. Why don't you guys go ahead and uh, stand with us? We're going to begin singing together. Uh, this is one of my favorite hymns. It's not uh, it qualifies as a hymn. It wasn't written too long ago, though. I love how it walks us through the salvation story, and really that all of us and our, our only hope is in Christ, and that He died on a cross, but that He rose again. So as we sing this, uh, I just invite you to reflect on what He has done for each one of you. Uh, that these words, maybe there's a certain phrase that just hits your heart. Um, but as we begin this morning, I just want to uh, pray together, and then we'll uh, begin to sing in Christ alone together. Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence. Lord, we thank you that we can be in this place gathered together. Lord, we ask that your presence would be known in this place, that we would recognize that you are at work in our lives and want to speak to us. So as we worship you, May we worship you in spirit and truth. In the truth of our lives that we believe and hold to you as all truth. The God who loves us, who gave his son for us. And that our spirits would be alive because of your work in us. Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my son, the cornerstone, solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What hearts are love?
more time together. We got to declare this out. But one of the words, uh, the, one of the lines in this chorus is when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. I love that image because it's a sign of surrender, right? And so that is what we're declaring this morning, that God, we have our ways of doing things. We have our will in things. But when we fight, we fight on our knees because it's your way and your will that we desire above anything else. So let's sing that together. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high.
circumstances we come with today, that is the truth we believe, that there is nothing that is greater than your power to work in that situation, that you have all power and authority over life itself, and so when we face disease, we face family issues, we face just life decisions, we recognize that you have a way, you have, you can work in any situation to bring life, to bring healing, to provide a way when we don't know. We thank you that we can look back on our life and see your faithfulness. And so as we look forward, we say you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you for this time together in worship. We ask you that you would work in our lives as we go through this morning. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. As fast as usual this morning, but I'll try to keep it short and to the point for you. Um, first thing is our VBS that's happening July 19th through the 21st. Um, there's a little bit more time to sign up kids if you need to do that as well as um, there's a couple tables out in the lobby for, uh, we still need a few volunteers for the actual days of EBS who can um, help run stations or set up and tear down. We need some, a couple trucks to haul some stuff over to Storvik Park, as well as there's a clipboard of um, a list of like donation items that we need. We still need a few um, snacks donated. We're looking for the pop-up portable soccer goals that we can borrow, as well as actually a couple basketball hoops that are just 
curbside ones that we can toss in a truck and we'll haul over um, for the day. So um, please check that out. If any of those things interest you, if you can't give your time, but you can give some in a different way, please check that out out there. Um, Secondly, 4th of July is coming, and that is typically our home church Sunday where we would not be here together, but in our home churches. But this 4th of July, we're going to be here, but we're going to be here at 9.30. So it's like when we change our clocks, but only a half an hour. So 9.30, you have to be here. We're going to do a shorter family service. Kids will be in service and actually kind of a part of the service. Um, and then we will quickly head downtown. Um, by about 10.30 to go try to catch the parade together. So I know it's probably crowded down there. Bring chairs, bring sunscreen, bring your food. If you, also all of this stuff is in the bulletin. Um, and so it says B-Y-O-F-C-B-E, okay? Which means bring your own food, clothing, blanket, etc. Okay? So for the, for the parade, you want to B-Y-O-F-C-B-E, okay? <laughs> yes, chairs. Chairs is a good thing. Okay, so that's next Sunday. So we're here at 9.30, then headed to the parade. Um, and then, you know, we have been in a series um, on Acts, and it, we've been talking about how the Holy Spirit came and helped um, empower us to be powerful witnesses. So my next three things are all kind of aligned with the book of Acts and what we're learning. Um, the first one is we saw the disciples in the early church gathering together and they were praying. So we are going to be doing a few nights through the summer, a prayer and worship. Our first one is July 8th at 6 p.m. here. And so those nights will be focused on just creating space for quiet prayer, reflection, worship, just time to be in that place. So. Um, July 8th at 6 p.m. That will be our first one, and we'll have a few more over the summer. So we'll be looking for those dates. Um, as well as the disciples in the early church gathered together. So we love gathering together, and typically July 10th is our men's breakfast, which is here. But that Saturday, all our men are going to be going to Oak Harbor. They're doing a men's retreat for the day with their men's ministry and our men are going to be joining them so that is going to be from nine to three and they provide all this really awesome food and a day together as men um, at the church there in living word so if you are interested in that you typically come to our men's breakfast and you'd like to spend the day at their retreat please go to their website livingword.com um, and sign up so that they can plan that food for you um, then, lastly, um, we have been talking about how the Holy Spirit empowers us to be powerful witnesses. So this morning, we have Mike, who's here with the Gideons. And if you don't know the Gideons and all that they do, that is their huge focus. They are powerful witnesses all throughout the world. Um, so he's just going to share a little bit of what they do this morning before Tim comes up. So if you could welcome Mike up for me. young family was waiting in a line of cars six blocks long and they were excited about that maybe excited just to get out of the house during COVID-19 but they were waiting to drive through a parking lot that had four live nativity scenes set up with live actors in costumes and uh, there were there were no other family Christmas activities uh, open in Oak Harbor that were open to the general public. Four churches, a Christian school, and the Gideons partnered together for one night only life drive through nativity scene. And we were able to hand out a testament to each car as it came through so that they could follow along the nativity scenes with the Christmas story in Luke 2. That night we handed out 200 testaments and we had two left as the last car came through. God provided just enough at the right time. Now for the fourth year, our camp supported the Toys for Tots event in the old Everett 
armory building. And because many uh, local service agencies were either closed or only op open and operating in a limited way because of COVID, Toys for Tots was asked to cover twice the area from, from Bellingham down to North King County. They had half the space that they normally operated out of, and they were asked to service twice as many people. Now, <clears throat> local churches and business volunteers uh, prepared bags of toys and clothing for families as they came through. And while they waited for those, the Gideons were able to give them a New Testament. And we were able to share the good news of Jesus Christ and a cup of hot chocolate. Eight Gideon camps in the area served and distributed over 2,000 testaments over three weeks. And we staffed uh, three shifts a day, six days a week for the three weeks leading up to Christmas. We had about 15 minutes with each family to share the Christmas story and the gift of God's grace. One common theme, we also collected prayer requests. And one common theme that surprised me uh, as I read them over was how many people were looking for guidance they were looking for a fresh start, a new start. They were looking for guidance on how to do that. And I realized at that point that many agencies might be able to provide food and clothing, but not very many provide spiritual help that people are looking for. I could not imagine a better way to give that guidance to people than to share God's word, the help section in the front, and the plan of salvation in the back with those families. <clears throat> also introducing them to God's word and uh, helping them and encouraging them to seek out a local church to start attending. I learned another thing that day. When the Holy Spirit calls on you, you hear that voice saying, maybe you should talk to somebody. It could be a total stranger, it could be a family member, a co-worker, um, somebody that you don't even know. Listen to that voice. <clears throat> Give a, an empathetic ear and actually do more listening than talking. And the Holy Spirit will open up doors of opportunity for you to share the gospel with that person. And especially in this kind of woke culture we're in today, don't assume that people don't want to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. God has a purpose. And, you know, as you see, Gideons believe in Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word, which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return void without succeeding in the matter for which I sent. Amen. That's what the Gideon ministry is, is all about, putting hope and a new life in Christ in the form of God's word in the hands of people who in many cases have no other hope. You know, no one really anticipated how 20 20 would unfold, but COVID-19 did not take God by surprise. And he's guiding us into 2021. Our objectives remain the same. We continue to win others for Jesus Christ, men and women, boys and girls, through personal work, through personal testimony, serving together as Christians, and the placement and distribution of God's word. And we've been doing that for over 100 years, the Gideons. Last year, we distributed over 65 million testaments around the world. You probably think of the Gideons as those folks who put the Bibles in hotels. We do do that, but that's really just a small portion of, of the Bibles that we distribute around the world. Most go into traffic lanes of life that target young adults because they are the most impressionable and they're looking for spiritual things. And locally, we distribute scriptures in schools like Oak Harbor High School, colleges like Skagit Valley, uh, hospitals like Island here in Anacortes, uh, the county jail in Coopville, retirement homes, and to our country's armed services. Now, we have had a saying in our camp this year, go to where the people are. And we had to do that because those normal traffic lanes, the ones I just described, were many of those were closed to us and not available. So we had to get more creative and more bold. 
And primarily because time is getting short and the work of God has called us to doesn't stop. Uh, it has simply looked different this year. For example, it is getting harder and harder to reach young adults in our public schools. In fact, on the south end of Whidbey Island, the schools are out in the middle of kind of nowhere and they, they don't have public streets around them. We don't have access to those schools. So one of the things we're doing is trying to find ways to find where young adults go. One of them is the Whidbey Island County Fair in Langley. It is open this year. I think it's the 15th through the 18th or something like that. We will have a booth at the fair and we hope to reach a lot of those kids on the south end of Whidbey Island that we don't normally do. We've done the same thing with Holland Happening, but it's been closed the last two years. But we'll be back when Holland Happening happens again. Now you may not realize it, but internationally your church supports uh, over 250,000 born again business and professional men and their wives. They participate in our ministry as well. Uh, as, as Gideon missionaries around the world, in over 200 countries, uh, distributing scriptures in over 108 languages. They are already there. You don't have to send them, teach them the language. They know where all the schools, prisons, hospitals, colleges are. So how can you help? Uh, we need prayers for the 200 students that received testaments at Oak Harbor High School and Middle School this year, this spring. Also pray that God places people in our path at the Whidbey Island County Fair in three weeks. Also pray that our students get back to school here in Anacortes this fall and we can uh, distribute scriptures to them. Also students at Western uh, College in Bellingham, Skagit College in Mount Vernon and Mill Carter. Then we need your financial support because the finances for this, the purchase of scriptures largely provided by free will offerings from churches like this one. Every cent represents a gift from God, and every cent you give goes to the printing and distribution costs of God's word. You know, after the service, I'll be standing out at a display we have. Uh, me and Brent would be happy to talk to you about it if you want to become a Gideon, and uh, we just pray that, uh, that uh, Come by, talk to us. Also, would love to hear your stories about how you became, uh, or maybe got a, a, a Gideon Bible at school or in the armed services. Thank you so much uh, for having us today and uh, sharing the stewardship report. Pastor Tim, thank you for for uh, discipling this church to go out and serve the Lord. Yeah, thank you. Can we can we thank him for his. I want to pray for you guys. You asked for a prayer, and I want to just do that and for you, Mike, uh, as well right now. Lord, we, we thank you for men and women who have said yes to your calling on their life to go out into this world. Lord, there's a boldness that it takes to say, hey, I want to show you the gospel. I want to give you a testament. Uh, New Testament of Scripture or, or the whole Bible, whatever it would be, and yet they're engaging conversation with people. I pray for favor for him as he goes to the South End and uh, to other other places where they would have opportunity to engage with people, or that you would give them insight and wisdom through your Spirit, that prompting of your Holy Spirit in him, you'd have wisdom and insight into people's lives as they would begin to talk with them, that you would uh, speak your life through him and, and through other Gideons. We thank you for the work that they are doing, that, that your Holy Spirit is filling them and making them a powerful witness into our world. We thank you for your work here. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, thank you so much, Mike. I, I would encourage you guys, um, there's a, a pamphlet that you all should have gotten the way in. If you want to support and give to the Gideons, really great ministry that they do. Uh, as we have talked about over the last couple of weeks, the Holy Spirit fills us to make us a powerful witness. And there is something about stepping out and, and handing somebody a Bible and saying, hey, this, this is life, this is hope. They're, these words are alive. And, and while it, it may feel like, well, you're just giving them a book. No, we believe that God's word is alive. And as they open it up, that God will speak to them through those words. Yeah. And there's oftentimes that that leads into conversations as you are sharing 
Mike, so thank you for doing that. But that's what I love about what we've talked about over the last couple of weeks is this is what the Holy Spirit does in us. He makes us a powerful witness. That's what he came to do, to, to fill us and empower us to be a witness to this world, a witness to what God has done in our lives, and to share that with others. This is a promise that he has given us. And I, I, I just want to uh, start back here. Jesus said in John 7, 37 through 39, then on the most important day of the feast, the last day, Jesus stood up and shouted to the crowds, all you thirsty ones, come to me. Come to me and drink. On a day like today, that sounds awesome, right? You know, give me some living water. I'm never thirsty again. He says, believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out of you from within, flowing from your innermost being, just like the scripture says. Verse 39, Jesus was prophesying about the Holy Spirit. The believers were being prepared to receive, but the Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out upon them because Jesus had not yet been unveiled in his full splendor. Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit to come. But what I love, if you notice it, he said, just like the scripture says, rivers of living water will pour out. This was prophesied in the Old Testament as well. Many prophets before, in fact, the prophecy that Jesus was talking about is in Zechariah 14, 8. On the day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, this continual flow. This is the prophet Zechariah. He was speaking of what the Holy Spirit was going to do when he came to Jerusalem. And as the Holy Spirit was poured out on these first believers, his spirit would then drive them out, send them out to Judea, Samaria, and beyond to be a powerful witness. So God is a God who is faithful. When he speaks, he does it. As we come to Acts 2 today, I want to preface it a little bit. See, Acts 2, it's, real, it's a very significant section of Scripture because it's the birthplace of the church. It's the beginning of the church. And anytime you want to look at what it probably should have looked like, you go back to the beginning, right? If we want to know what America was meant to be, what do we go to? Constitution, hopefully, right? It's kind of up for grabs, seems like, lately, but... That was the original document that was written to give us guidance on what our country should be run by, the rules and everything in it. We go back to the original to know what it should look like. We could look at America around now and say, well, this is what America is, but is that what it was intended to be? Same with the church. We can look at the church today and we can say, well, this is what church is. But we have to go back to the beginning, Acts 2, and say, was that what it is intended? Is what happened in Acts 2 happening in our churches today? Those are the things that we have, that, that's what we should be asking as we walk through this. It should filter, help us filter through what we see in church, what we believe about church. And so the book of Acts becomes this kind of guiding little guideposts along as we're figuring out what does this look like to walk my faith with Jesus Christ in relationship with other believers. It's the birth of the church. We need to strip back what we've heard, seen, or heard and get back to the beginning. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you for this morning. I pray that your spirit would open our eyes to your truth through your word. May the words that I speak be pleasing to you, God, and may they direct our hearts towards you. This is your church. This is your people. These are your people, each one of us, and we want to live the way you want us to. We want to be a church, a body of believers that brings glory to you. So would you work in our hearts through the message today. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Acts 2 is where we're going to be at. Acts 2, 1 through 13. 
If you have your Bibles, or it'll be up on the screen. I'm going to say this right at the beginning. Laura, sorry if I jump around a little more than is in my notes, but uh, <laughs> that may happen this morning. Acts 2, 1 through 13, let's read together. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they had heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men to, who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to, Ju converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we heard them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. This is the beginning of the church, the filling of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of confusion and kind of some craziness that can surround this. And sometimes I think we get so wrapped up that the, oh, the Holy Spirit, he's crazy. I, I don't know what I think about him, so I'm just going to kind of throw that out, throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing, where it's just like, that's, I'll stick to scripture, I'll stick to um, Jesus, and I, I like that part, but the Holy Spirit, unpredictable. I want to encourage you to set aside any negative experiences or thoughts towards the activity of the Holy Spirit. Set those aside in your mind today, because what you, we need to do is come to scripture and say, what's true? What do we read about in Scripture? And let that inform what we believe about who the Holy Spirit is and the activity and His work in our lives. Because if we don't, we will let our experiences dictate what we believe. And that's a very shaky foot. I remember a time where we had gone through something really painful. Melissa had uh, lost one of our baby. We had, we had lost a baby. and. There was this moment of time between when she was going to go get a DNC and, and have that taken care of her to uh, when we had found out. And I felt very strongly from the Lord that I wanted to pray for life for this baby. And I, and I struggled with it. I kind of was like, that's too much. I don't want to do that. And, I, and yet I felt like I was supposed to pray for life. And so we prayed and we even asked the doctor to do another ultrasound just to make sure. We had already had one or two at that point. And we're like, can you just please make sure? And we prayed and believed in God for a miracle. And yet it didn't happen. And that was difficult, right? I'm not going to lie. That was really tough to navigate through. But what I know is if I let that experience dictate what I believe about God, then I will say, well, God's not a healer. He doesn't answer prayer. And yet I know he does. I see it in scripture. And so I have to look at those situations where my experience and my reality doesn't line up with what's, what happens in scripture or what I believed for and say, okay, Lord, help me. Help me in those times to know what it is that was going on. Maybe I, I misheard you. I don't know fully what it was that you were speaking at that moment, or maybe you were allowing me to pray and see you answer in a different way than I thought. We may not know, but what I want to encourage you is to set aside some of those experiences where you may say, well, God doesn't do that anymore. I tried that once, and this happened. And as we read through Acts, let's anew look at Acts and say, okay, 
This is how the Holy Spirit interacted with the early church. Do we believe that he can do the same things? And would we believe him for that today? The background to Pentecost, it's, uh, it's really known, traditionally it was known as the Feast of Harvest. It was seven weeks, seven, seven weeks of seven. So on the 50th day was this harvest, Feast of Harvest, really thanking the Lord for all he had given the Israelites. Some Jews believe it was celebrated to commemorate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, that the Lord came down 50 days after the Passover and gave the law to Moses. And now we see 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit is given that no longer is the law necessary for our lives. Now we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit who gives us holiness, who can give us life. And so we know, I think it's in Ezekiel, he says the, the law will be written on your heart. That now as we have the Holy Spirit in us, we, we walk with him, we have holiness through us because of the work of the Holy Spirit. So Pentecost, is a celebration of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then the, the last thing I'll just point out before we get into specifically what we are looking at the section today, it's a reversal of Babel. Isn't it interesting that uh, Genesis 11 talks about a story where men came together to unify, to make a name for themselves, to be known as great. And as they did that, God saw that their hearts were wicked and evil. And so what did he do? He divided their language. We talked about that back in January, actually. We went through Genesis 11. But what we see in Acts 2 is this great reversal. Because what happens in Acts 2? All of a sudden, people who don't know other people's languages are speaking in their native tongues. These other people are saying, wait, those, those are Jews. How do they know my language? How do they know? And they're praising God. And so you see this great reversal of the language barrier through the work of the Holy Spirit. So when we look at this first section, the initial work of the Holy Spirit, what do we see? We see number one, and we talked about this a little bit or quite a bit last week, there was unity. They were all together, right? They were all together in this upper room. Disciples who had many reasons to divide, they were together. Just remind you that they were from various backgrounds, tax collectors, zealots, the ones who wanted to fight against the government, ones who were working for the government. Uh, they, they were together in unity. I often wonder if we as a church were unified in heart and mind what the Lord would work. Second thing I notice is the Holy Spirit came suddenly and they heard and saw evidence of his presence. He came suddenly, but they heard it. It says in, in verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole out house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. There was this violent wind that blew. If you look out through the Old Testament, the breath of God, the ruah, the, this, this breath of God that would breathe life. Genesis 2, 7 is where we see it first. And the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and the man became a living creature. We received a new breath from God at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came and breathed new life into the church. I want to read through this section of Ezekiel because I believe it, it, it brings about this. This is what looks like is going on here in Acts. It's kind of, you have the skeletons of the church, and yet there's not a life and a power that's happening. And so it's almost like these bones are here, the disciples are here waiting, and it's at the moment that the 
that God moves, that he breathes life in this army, it arises. And I believe Ezekiel, this vision that Ezekiel has is a picture of what is happening in the church in Acts 2. Ezekiel's vision, chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, there were, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and you shall, and, I, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and the flesh had come upon them, and sin and the skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord, Come from the four winds, O breathe, and breathe. O oh, breath and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. But it's not finished. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it, declares the Lord. It's God who breathes life into his church in Acts 2. This empowering and filling of the Holy Spirit breathes life into the church and raises them up from dead to alive and saying, okay, we're ready to go be powerful witnesses. Who was Peter some 40 days before this, denying Christ, running away? On Pentecost, stands before thousands of people because 3,000 were saved, boldly proclaiming Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He empowers us and so we see this wind and then we also see fire fire often represented God's presence Mount Sinai there's fire and smoke that engulfed the mountain when Moses went up to get the law there's a pillar of fire that led Israel through the desert at night but it's interesting fire also is known for purifying And that fire doesn't just stay in a column kind of distant, but it separates itself out as tongues of fire and comes to rest on each person. The Holy Spirit purifies us, brings holiness to our lives so that no longer do we need this list of rules to follow, but as His Spirit is alive in us, we live holy, we live different. It's not to say we won't struggle with sin, but man, the conviction of the Holy Spirit leaves those short-lived seasons where we're like, man, I can't live in that because I know I'm supposed to be different. His Spirit is alive in us. The other thing to note about this, where the Holy Spirit came and spread out on each one, it says all were filled, not most. Not some, but all. 
Every single person in that room was filled with his spirit, where before the Holy Spirit had been given to prophets, priests, kings, and maybe the Holy Spirit was there for just a, a little bit of time and then he would be gone. The Holy Spirit was now poured out on all people, all who would believe in the name of Jesus Christ. First Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you, what, out of darkness into his wonderful light. What are we to do? Declare the praises of him. That's what the work of the Holy Spirit does. He causes us to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his glorious light. And as they are empowered, they begin to speak in other languages, praising God. It's interesting that people are then drawn around this noise, this wind, this fire, and they hear the noise of people praising God, and they're drawn, and there's these onlookers, and they look, and they say, what is going on? Some were amazed, and yet others mocked. When we've seen the powerful work of the Holy Spirit, sometimes it's easy to be skeptical. There are times where we look at something that the Holy Spirit has done, people falling on the ground, things that, speaking in tongues that we don't understand, and we say, that, that's craziness. And we may want to mock it or say, I, I don't understand that, so I'm just, you know, I'm staying out of it. Others were amazed, thinking, what is going on? Can I encourage that that would be our response? When the Holy Spirit does things that we don't understand or can't explain, that instead of mocking or just distancing ourselves, because that's what mocking is doing. It's like, I don't get that. That's crazy. They're drunk. You know, that's my only explanation right now. Instead of that response, maybe our response would be amazement. God, I don't understand that. What is going on here? Help me to see. Is that your spirit of work? Peter, as I mentioned earlier, goes on to preach a powerful message. And the work of the Holy Spirit in him directed him to be a powerful witness. And over 3,000 were saved that day. So where does that leave us as a church? Where does that leave Living Rock and each one of us as we uh, think moving forward with the Holy Spirit? I would encourage you, seek the Holy Spirit. The baptism, the filling of the Spirit, not just kind of like, yeah, I like the Holy Spirit, and I, a little bit on the side, you know, but the filling till he overflows out of us. Would you say, yes, I want all of you? I want your spirit active and at work in my life. Sometimes we can get caught up into sensations, these experiences where people are speaking in tongues or falling on the ground, and we're almost seeking the experience versus the giver of those gifts. May we be the people that keep our eyes focused on the one who gives the gifts and not get caught up into some of the things that happen. Although those are great and can bring glory to him, which is what they're intended to do, anytime they're doing something outside of that, I really believe that if it's drawing people's attention to our person, that's not what the Holy Spirit is there to do. He's there to give glory to God. And that begins to help us wade through that. But we seek the Holy Spirit. We want all that he has for us. First Corinthians 14, five says, I, Paul says this when talking about um, the gifts. I would that you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. The fact remains that some in the Corinthian church did not speak in tongues. And Paul accepted that, but encouraged all to desire all the gifts. So you may not all speak in tongues, right? 
But if, but if you don't, and you've been like, that's too weird for me, or prophecy that gets a little crazy, I don't want that. I like these other, the gift of service, absolutely, that's me. These ones that we kind of feel more like, hey, I understand that, that makes sense to me. Would we seek all the gifts, even the ones that are supernatural, that we can't explain? Healing, prophecy, words of knowledge. If you're wondering, like, hey, what do I, this is kind of crazy, That's I, I don't know where to go with this. Can I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14? The Apostle Paul teaches the Corinthian church not only about the gifts, but orderly worship and the expression of the gifts within a church. Now, we probably fall far on the other side where I don't have very many people coming up and saying, I have a prophetic word for the church. Paul says, hey, don't have more than three. I don't know if I've had one in maybe six months. So I feel like the area I'm saying, Lord, would you begin to allow those to bring up? rise in this church so that your body can be encouraged and life can be uh, given through the work of your spirit into this church. That's what I'm praying for. We're not on the other side where Paul was saying, hey, limit it to three. There's too many, too much going on in that church. You know, it's too chaotic. Or speaking in tongues where people are speaking out loud and an unbeliever walks into their midst and like, this is craziness. I don't understand what's going on. Paul talks about the gift of tongues that it is for the building up of the individual believer where prophecy is for the church. So there are ways in which these gifts are meant to be used and we can learn from that and we'll talk a little bit more as we go through the book of Acts. But read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, read Romans 12. These are the workings of the Holy Spirit in the church. And we want all that he has for us. And then finally, the Holy Spirit is a gift God gives us to enable us to carry out his ministry in and through us, not a tool for us to use. There was a man in Acts 8. His name was Simon. He was a magician. And he saw the disciples doing powerful works, healing, healing people, lame men walking. There, there was a lot of things going on around the disciples. And so Simon, this magician, he had come to faith in Jesus. He had been baptized, actually. It's interesting. And he, he came to the disciples and he was like, I see your power. I want to buy it. I want to buy your power because his, his motives were selfish. He made his money off of working miracles. Anytime it starts the work of the Holy Spirit starts drawing like this kind of greed or some sort of like uh, grabbing hold or becomes about us, it's no longer his work. So we seek these gifts not for our sake, but that God will be glorified through us. The gifts are given to strengthen our witness to the power of what God has done in our lives. I'm going to invite the worship team back up as we conclude this morning. We're going to sing a song that um, you may know, but I love the, uh, the bridge of it. It says, breathe the breath of God, breathe. Bring life. It talks about kind of this arising, giving life. And I want to pray that over us as a church. If you are here and you want to receive the Holy Spirit, maybe you've never asked and been prayed for, can I encourage you, throughout Acts, there's many different ways the Holy Spirit came. Sometimes people were just kind of talking, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Many times the apostles would lay hands on people and pray for them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. I want to make that available to you. Melissa will be here to pray. And actually, Bob, can I ask you if you would be over on this side to just, if anybody wants prayer and you want to receive the Holy Spirit, or maybe you, you have something else you'd like prayer for during this time, I'd invite you to listen to the words of, these song, of this song um, as we conclude this morning, and that our hearts would say, do I want all you have, Holy Spirit? When we begin to look at the early church, do I want your life and your movement the way we see it in 
my brother in church. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that we can we can get back to the beginning, Lord. I, I believe your word was written so that we wouldn't forget the work that you did originally in your church. And may we recognize areas where even this church, where we have maybe quenched your Holy Spirit and we have not allowed you to move freely for fear of something weird or something that we can't explain happening. And yet for the sake of your name being great and your name being known, I pray for that work to continue, to move, that it would, you would breathe life into us, each one of us, to be a powerful witness to your glory. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
desire all of who you are not bits and pieces I like that, I don't like this but we would say Holy Spirit have your way in our lives true surrender not in part but in whole were that yet again in your presence or praying together asking for your spirit to come and you came once again and you filled again so Lord we ask day by day fill us with your spirit and bring us boldness to be a powerful witness of the goodness of the work that you have done in our lives thank you that you are faithful and you will do that work in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, church, it's so good to be with you. And, you know, I'm thankful that God is Jesus Christ. He's the same. That's our the verse back there, Hebrews 13. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that we have a God who doesn't change. And so as we begin to work through Acts as a church, it's not to say, oh, that's the way he worked then, but we can believe that he can work now in our lives and through us to bring him glory. And that's what I want to believe for and I want to see as we grow together as a church in unity and allow his work. So I want to encourage you to come out to those nights of prayer and worship. I think that the Lord will do some significant things. And kids are welcome. And I know sometimes like, oh, they might be loud. Hey, that's okay. They're a part of this family as well. So we encourage that and we love that. 